So I'm Dr. Panamalam, um, pediatric gastroenterologist. I work at the Children's and Women's Hospital and the Strata Center. So just for my interest, how many of you are in the healthcare field? Okay, a couple of them, just to you know, know so that I can use, I'm going to use some medical terms, but I can explain. And the students also there? They're from undergraduates? You're undergraduates? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. And some parents, I guess. Okay. So today's topic is on uh, constipation in children. So why I decided to talk about this is uh, not some exotic topics. The reason is uh, this is one of the very common conditions being referred to us in the GI clinic. So we see this a lot and it is uh, quite an important condition and it's a chronic problem and it is distressing to the parents as well as to the children and so that's the reason I selected this topic because of the commonality. Okay. So we'll talk about a few uh, details about what, what is constipation. So we need to know what is constipation, how it is defined and uh, what is the prevalence? That's not much important anyway. Uh, what are the types of constipation? And most important is uh, what causes this constipation in children? And I'm going to also touch upon you know, a little bit about infants too. So what causes it? What do you do when a child comes with constipation? And uh, how do you treat it? How do you manage this problem? Uh, any questions you can ask, you can stop me and ask me anytime. Or if you want to wait till then, that's fine too. It's, it, Okay, so, so what are the objectives? So main thing is the objectives is to understand how constipation occurs in children and uh, what is functional constipation and what is uh, organic. So I'll uh, describe the, uh, what, what it means, what is functional, what is organic. So <clears throat> what is, uh, how to evaluate a child when it comes with constipation and how do you manage them? And if you have time, we can talk about what's called Hirschsprung's disease. It's a totally different condition. Okay. Okay, so what is functional constipation? Okay, this is a term which I don't agree with, but this is for, form, formed by the so-called experts. So the experts have coined the term what they don't know as functional. Okay, so it's you have functional nausea, functional vomiting, functional abdominal pain, so all this, we don't know what causes it. Uh, main thing is to know what it is, is there is no underlying cause for the disease. So that's what it is called as functional. Uh, what is organic means there is an underlying cause for the disease, so that's called as organic. So this is, so because sometimes the parents come as a second opinion, they say my child has been diagnosed with functional constipation. So you know, no, they don't know what is a functional means. And apparently, it's supposed to be the function of the GI tract. So, you know, function of the GI tract is mainly digestion, absorption, and elimination. So, if something goes wrong, uh, there, there can be underlying problem. So, that's called functional. And uh, no anatomical malformations. You know, we'll talk about that. What is anatomical causes for the constipation? And that's very important to exclude. And medications. But unfortunately, when we see kids with the functional constipation or non-organic, a lot of them are on medications which can cause constipation. So it's hard to differentiate what is causing the problem there. Okay, so what is uh, constipation? You know, it's a simple term, anything which is difficult to pass. You know, the, if, it, the, if the child can have bowel movements every day, but if it is hard to pass or if there is discomfort associated with it, that is called constipation. Actually, it's a very simple term to use. So sometimes the parents come and say, my child has a bowel movement every day, why do you say it is constipation? Uh, I'll go through it later on why it is that, especially if it is very hard. Look at the term. Uh, I guess this is the light. Uh, subjective, okay. Subjective is the, means that if the patient complains about hard stools, well, we as a pa pediatrician, we depend, uh, we depend on the parents to tell us about these uh, symptoms. That's, that's a problem in older children and adolescents because they're very private. They won't tell the parents what's going on. 
So <clears throat> it's usually less, any, anybody who is toilet trained and above, it's very difficult unless they have a couple of problems coming in later on. You know, usually they come in with this abdominal pain or they can come in with this stool accidents. They won't tell them they are constipated. So we have to ask this child what's going on with it because they will never tell the parents. They're very private about it when they are toilet trained. So it is a subjective symptom. Uh, so any passage of hot stools, large diameter stools, and infrequent stooling, most important is discomfort with stool. That's called constipation, okay? Okay, so, you know, when you Google it, you will come across this uh, uh, Rome, okay? So that's, I just wanted to touch briefly about what is this Rome. So these experts in the 1980s, I believe, were formed a committee in Rome, actually, they, to classify these functional disorders, you know? So they, are, they don't know, not much research is done in, in this at that time. Even now, not many studies are done, especially in children, it's very hard to do. So this Rome, uh, this, this committee members joined and uh, formed a classification for different types of functional disorders I talked to you. Constipation, irritable bowel syndrome, multiple things. So right now, you know, the 1980s, the first Rome 1 criteria came. Now we have what is called Rome 4 criteria. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so what is, the what is the advantage of using this? I'll tell you later. Uh, fecal impaction. So what is fecal impaction? You know, so when the child comes uh, with the constipation, we tell them that the child is impacted. Uh, that means there is a stool blocking at the lower part. I think I have some... I'm going to show you the anatomy of the colon later. So if the stool is blocked, right here. So this is like, you know, this is a colon. It's not exactly like this in the body, you know, it's different. So if the stool is blocked right there at the bar, in the rectal area and nothing is coming out, that is a fecal impaction. Okay, so this is the Rome criteria. So what is, uh, I'm not going to discuss in detail about this. So what is this Rome criteria used for? I mean, basically, you know, they have all these things we never, you know, memorize this, it's hard to memorize. So it is used for research purposes. You know, we, we're going to do a research and start treatment, especially using medications. This is only used for research purposes, but you can see it's the same thing, a hard, difficult to pass stools, large diameter stools, or accidents. So that is the Rome criteria. Okay, so next is a Bristol stool chart. Actually, it is quite a, good to use it. So what is Bristol stool chart? So it, it describes about the type of stool. Okay, so this is also used, it can be used in research purposes to document what type of stool the child has or to give it to the parents to tell them to keep a stool diary. So what type of stool the child has while on treatment. And sometimes when the child comes to our clinic, they are so private, they are very shy, they don't want to tell us what type of stool they have, how it is. So in that case, we can show them this chart to tell them what type of stool you're having. Okay, so this type one, two, one and two is constipation. So this is the first one is the very hard uh, stool with like lumps. It's very difficult to pass. That's very severe constipation. And uh, type three and four is supposed to be normal. And uh, six and seven are diarrhea. Uh, five is very mild diarrhea. You know, in, you, I still don't agree with this part here, passing like a sausage, you know, sausage with cracks. In children, we aim to have a soft stool when we treat them. Uh, even this, it's not a very good type of stool. It should be, you know, softer than that. Okay, so the, this is the Bristol stool chart. Uh, okay, so what is this? Uh, I, I thought I'll touch briefly upon infant constipation. So this is a term you might come across. Uh, dysthesia, not meaning this difficulty in stooling. Again, this is uh, coined by the experts, and uh, you know this. This I don't agree with it. Actually, this you know this is this. You can see the child is arching the back, uh, passing to trying to pass a stool. 
And this child will, once in two or three days, will have a, this type of episodes of pain, occurring for 10, 15 minutes, cries and cries, and then have a soft stool. I mean, say so they don't know what causes it. So one of the theories they say is, probably the infant is not able to relax. It puts pressure in the tummy, and then it's not able to relax at the bottom. That's what the problem is. We don't know. So, but what I do is, I usually look for this cow's milk protein intolerance. That's what we commonly see. And, uh, you know, they say it spontaneously resolves. This is all the experts from the Rome criteria I was talking about. Um, <clears throat> but cow's milk protein intolerance also, you know, spontaneously resolves around 11 months or so, in most of the cases. So, I think it is most likely, it, there is some abnormality, definitely there is some abnormality undergoing uh, here with the child crying and episodic. And most of the time, it's, uh, we change the formula, they do better actually. Um, so, so uh, constipation, it's, as I said, is a very common cause. In infants, 50% uh, of them have one of those symptoms. Constipation, regurgitation is speeding up, or pain, or colic symptoms. And 25% uh, of our referrals are due to this. And uh, as I mentioned, this is becoming really, really common, cow's milk protein intolerance. And uh, so <clears throat> I just put a note here, blood test, skin test, and patch test not useful. So sometimes uh, we get a referral from an allergist. Sometimes the parents <coughs> come and ask about getting an allergist testing. So I tell them not to waste time, not to do this, because this type of allergy is totally different from what we see with the uh, uh, peanut allergy or egg allergy reaction that's called anaphylaxis. That's totally different from what we have here. This is called, this is a delayed reaction to the milk protein. And also sometimes the parents as well as even the pediatricians get confused between <coughs> lactose intolerance and cow's milk protein intolerance. It's totally, to two things totally different. And it's, it's uh, sad to see they undergo multiple formula changes like lactose-free formula. So infants never have lactose intolerance, okay? It is very, very, very uncommon. Um, lactase deficiency occurs one in few million. I've never seen here. It's supposed to be common in Finnish population. So I tell them not to keep changing the formula from lactose containing to lactose-free. So lactose intolerance is not common at this age. It's, also, it's the protein intolerance, and it can be cow's milk protein, soy protein, usually they are, uh, <clears throat> if a cow's milk protein occurs, it's, it's also due to soy protein. So we try to change it to a different type of formula, and the, the blood test, skin, tech, skin test, and patch testing, nobody does patch testing here, only few places does it. Uh, it's not useful at all. Because if you go to the allergist, they will do this blood test or a skin test and say, the child is not allergic and you send it back and, the, and it's going to be really confusing to the parents. Okay, so, um, so you know, when I was uh, training, they used to say that uh, breast milk and formula are the same, okay? So at that time, a lot of uh, parents, you know, I don't know, maybe some of them may know, uh, switched from breast milk to formula, actually. I mean, maybe sponsored by industry, I don't know. I never trust uh, industry-sponsored studies, to be frank. Uh, I mean, I just take it with a pinch of salt whenever they, it is sponsored by the industry. Um, so a lot of uh, parents switched from uh, uh, breast milk to formula. It took a lot of effort uh, from the pediatricians and the doctors to go back to the, form, uh, to the breast milk. Uh, so you can see the breastfed infants have a good bowel movement uh, seven times to 12 times a day sometimes. And uh, very occasionally they can have a bowel movement once a week, even up to once in two weeks. It's, uh, you know, sometimes the frequency varies in breastfed infants. But in the formula, the constipation is much more common. Uh, what is it? Why it is, uh, nobody knows, but one of the theory is, uh, you know, there are different types of fat, and the breast milk has a lot of this uh, unsaturated fat, long chain fa fatty acids. They can't replicate it, so they use the palm oil, or vegetable oils, and one of the theory is that maybe one of the reasons they get constipated. So formula is really constipating. Um, 
And then when the solids are introduced at four months, uh, they can get constipated. So look for alarm signs. So we, what are those alarm signs? We'll go through that next few, few slides. So we need to know what is the frequency. Uh, so in older children, so what is the, as you can see, as they get older, the frequency decreases. So the infants, they can pass up to three to four stools a day. The child, around two years, one or two times a day. The adults, it varies from three times a week to, you know, once in three times, uh, three times a day to three times a week. And uh, why the infants and children have much more frequent ball movements? That is uh, due to what is called as a gastrocolic reflux. So what it is, is it's important to know that. Um, so when they eat, you know, the stomach sends a signal to the colon to empty. So that is predominant in uh, infants and children. Actually, we make use of that uh, while treating constipation, you know. So that is called gastrocolic reflux. It's very predominant in children and infants. It's not as much pronounced in adults. So child eats, you can see, some of them, you can see they just rush to the bathroom. That's normal, actually. That's very normal. Um, so what, why cow's milk intolerance causes constipation? So usually, you know, the older, the cow's milk protein intolerance, usually they cause diarrhea and blood in the stool, but occasionally it can cause constipation. Actually, not occasionally, it's more frequently now. And they think it may be related to the irritation of the rectum from the protein intolerance. And um, so we do change the formula if they come in with the constipation, sorry, to protein hydrolysis. What it is, is it's a broken down protein. Okay, so what is a, a fecal incontinence? You know, so it, I'm going to talk about fecal incontinence too because it's f part of the uh, constipation. So <clears throat> again, you note the term functional, meaning there is no underlying organic cause for the stool accidents. So it is defined as usually, um, sorry, Involuntary passage, it can be form stool, semi-form stool, liquid stool, in a child who's attained that was, was being toilet trained. So it doesn't at, it pertain to a child who's two years old or three years old, but uh, anybody above four years, even if it is not toilet trained, it is fecal incontinence. And it is pretty common. So the constipation, uh, you can see it keeps raising as they get to, as they age. Um, so it's about 3% uh, in uh, first, uh, first year, and then this, this is probably related to the starting the school and holding it, so the incidence is a little bit higher. Also the diet wise, it's not, they're not eating good diet. So we'll talk about the di diet later on. And uh, this is one of the common problems we see in our clinics, 25%, maybe more actually. So we do get a lot of referrals for constipation. Unfortunately, I think it's the diet, the poor diet, the fast foods, the junk foods, the processed foods, and uh, sodas, you know, so no, not drinking water. I, I think it's, uh, that's the main reason for this, all these uh, problems, you know, and uh, with that type of diet, obesity is prevalent, hypertension, diabetes, um, you know, knee problem, it's, and we see a fatty liver, which can lead to cirrhosis, so um, it's, uh, it's, I think it's related to the diet, one of the reasons. Um, okay, so I, I mean, I just told you, we talked about what, you know, normal anatomy of the colon. So when the stool comes through the small bowel, that's, it is liquid. So it is liquid, it has the roughage with the waste material and water. And usually it is green in color because the bile is green in color, okay? So then it goes through the, transits through the colon. Uh, this is the right colon, the middle colon, the left colon. This is what is called as a sigmoid colon. It's supposed to be shaped and the rectum. So as the stool transits through the colon, it can take anywhere from eight to up to 16 hours to go through it. And so what happens is the water is absorbed and the electrolytes are absorbed some of the fatty acids are absorbed. So colon is very important. So if they don't have a colon, it'll be a liquid stool. So it forms a formed stool and it comes to the rectum. So that's where the stool is stored. 
Okay? So <coughs> it's important to know this rectum and the sigmoid colon. I'll show, tell you later why. Now that's, a lot of people know that as the large intestine. Yes. Is that the same thing? Large intestine, yes, correct. Large intestine, yes. Small intestine and large intestine. So this is the small intestine, this is the large intestine. And as I mentioned, it is not exactly like this in the body, you know, it is, its shape varies. Um, sometimes the, it, this com, can come down all the way down to the pelvis and this can rise up to the, to the, you know, up to the belly bottom. So I will show you that. Okay, so basic uh, knowledge about what happens about what we call as defecation, that is uh, pooping. So, so as I mentioned, the stool comes and stays in the rectum here and so the, you know when, the, when, there is, when it is in the rectum it distends the colon so when it distends the colon that sends a sensation to the spinal cord and then to the brain okay there is stool there whether you have to go not to go so if there is no bathroom there no facilities okay so we can hold the stool and uh, you know at appropriate time this is the, there is a two, ty two types of smooth muscles inside. One is called the internal and the other one is the external. So this is not under voluntary control, so it is always tight, you know, it's always closed, keep kept tight. And um, when the person or the child decides to poop, this relaxes and then the, this one is under voluntary control. So this is called the external sphincter, it's under voluntary control, it can be kept tight closed so that you know that's how the withholding starts so <clears throat> when they don't when they decide to go they can relax this uh, and look at this this an, the angle so you know the as I mentioned it is not straight you know it, it, all the pictures say you know they'll show it is all straight like this the rectum and the anal it's not straight you can see it is there is a angle there See, this angle is very important. So it keeps the stool in the rectum. When they relax, uh, squats. Squatting is the best position for stooling, actually, you know, squatting. So when they squat, this becomes straight and the stool comes out. So, uh, so there are different mechanisms involved with the stooling. So in child who holds it, they will, they will squeeze and they will stand like this. <laughs> so it won't come out. So this, is a, this helps to uh, understand what's going on. Now how long, once your food gets in your stomach, how long should it, how long is it before actually it, it exits your body? About it, takes, uh, it depends on the transit, so it's up to 24 hours. Up to 24 yeah. hours. Yeah, so come to the, you know, it has to go through the stomach, it's about four hours, then it goes to the small intestine, it takes about eight hours to absorb all the food, all the nutrients. Then through the colon, it about 16 hours to go through the colon to come all the way to the rectum. This is a normal. When they have diarrhea, it can come out in you know four to eight hours. You know, so it depends on the uh, transit time. Okay, good question. Okay, okay. So what causes constipation? So this is the most common cause we see in children uh, with withholding the stool. So why they withhold it, what happens? So even one episode of painful bowel movement, you know, it triggers this problem. So one episode of painful bowel movement can be triggered because of the child was sick, was not eating or dehydrated, um, you know, or was holding it because there is no bathroom there. So what happens is when they uh, have painful bowel movement, they start holding it and it is just automatic actually it's not like the child is doing it so if you do the olden experts used to say it's all psychological it's nothing psychological okay uh, it is because of the pain they hold it so when they hold it i, I mean uh, if you go to the previous picture see this this is the rectum it, it can hold enormous amount of stool actually okay so then it can go to the sigmoid colon. So the stool will slowly get backed up and the sigmoid colon can rise up and come all the way to the belly button. I mean, I'll show you some pictures. It can come all the way. I mean, it looks like uh, some tumor or pregnancy. It can be really 
huge. I mean, you'll be surprised to see how big it can get. And you can see the feel the stool. So, and then so the rectum accommodates. See, we don't have any. Uh, so the colon, you know, the the all the all the bowel actually there is no bone in it. Okay, we are born outside. There is no bone there. God has made it that way so that it can distend. You know, when we eat, the stomach expands. Same way, if there is a stool, the colon expands. And it is made of smooth muscles. It can expand enormously, unfortunately. So, it, so it, rectum gets big. When it gets big, the stool stays there and all the water is pulled out. It gets very hard and it hurts to go that big stool. So the child holds more. So it becomes like a big cycle and then at, at the end they can have uh, accidents, overflow. So I'll show you that. Okay, so I, as I mentioned, functional. I mean, uh, there is no underlying etiology, underlying cause for this constipation. So most of the time in, in uh, development, I mean, infants, I, I mentioned it's cow's milk intolerance, and children with developmental delay and artist, autistic kids and ADHD, unfortunately, we see this very commonly. This is what we see common. Um, toilet phobia and uh, withholding. So this can start in uh, school age children, especially when they go to full day school, they don't like to use the bathroom there uh, and they start holding it. The reason is either it, there is no privacy, I mean, we'll be surprised to know that some of the schools, they don't have doors for the bathroom. So the child don't like to sit there. Or uh, there is sound, bullying, or, the, or it is dirty, so they hold it. So that's how the problem starts in a school age child. So certain ages, it's, it's more common at certain ages. One is, uh, you know, when your solids are introduced, at one year of age when cow's milk introduced. The other one is during the time of toilet training, the child refuses to undergo toilet training, uh, or when the child starts school. So <clears throat> this is the most common cause we see, the toilet phobia and uh, uh, bathroom avoidance. Uh, this, is, this is not very uh, common, it's the slow, what is called as the slow transit constipation, everything is moving slow and uh, we, the, we do, there is no exactly genes involved, you know, we, there is no, it's not a genetic condition, but by studies it shows that if it occurs in the parents and grandparents, the constipation is a little bit more common in the children compared to the general population. And this contributes to the constipation. <coughs> I talked about the diet, you know, the current diet of children consists of pizza, chicken nuggets, french fries, and sodas. I mean, unfortunately, that's what they eat and drink. And school diet is no better. Actually, they give like uh, pizzas and chicken nuggets, not much vegetables. I mean, unfortunately, the healthy diet is more expensive than the fast food, or the unhealthy diet or high calorie diet. So that's the truth, unfortunately. Um, we don't, unfortunately, we don't see this much. So organic means, uh, you know, as I mentioned, there is some underlying cause for that. And that's what we have to make sure when the child comes in with constipation, there is no underlying cause. Anatomic means there is some abnormality in the position of the anus or abnormality in the placement. I'll show you some pictures about that. Um, abnorm, you know, low tone. This is, a, this is, we don't see this very common. All this, we don't see this commonly, but it is important to make sure they don't have it. Um, yes, uh, drugs. Yeah, some, as I mentioned, a lot of kids with ADHD, they come in with uh, medication, so they, they'll be on methylphenidate. The kids we see with schizo disorders, they are on anti-epileptic medications. Um, narcotics, not much. Some, some of the sickle cell children, because of the pain, they will be on that, but usually it's a secondary cause. Um, these are all important to exclude. You know, this tethered uh, spinal cord abnormalities, sacral abnormalities. Um, this is a tumor. I mean, uh, Actually, I've seen only, so far, this is a very aggressive tumor. Luckily, I've only seen two in my life, so far, I mean, in my practice so far. Um, the, <clears throat> that's a very aggressive uh, tumor which can cause constipation. Uh, spina bifida, which is like abnormalities in the spinal cord. 
So uh, that has to be excluded. Uh, Hirschsprung's disease is uh, not, I mean, it can happen. Usually it's also a no abnormality. And we always look for uh, uh, high calcium and thyroid and celiac disease. So, you know, I think we talked about that, uh, starting solids and then, uh, you know, some acute episodes of uh, severe pain followed by holding it and uh, uh, toilet phobia. So this is the most common we see, toilet phobia and stool holding it, that's the most common we see. So if the child comes to, with constipation, what do you do? How do you evaluate? So history taking is most important and the ex examination and test. So what are the tests to do? What, what do you ask in the history? So what age it started? So if it starts in infancy, especially you know, before one month of age, you have to exclude other uh, serious problems. Um, so age at four months, you know, it's due to solids, one year probably due to cow's milk. At the two or three years of age, unlikely to be due to any serious diseases, but some conditions can cause constipation at that age. And how long the child has been constipated, how often the child has a bowel movement. So as I mentioned, sometimes the child has a bowel movement every day and uh, still they are constipated because of the hard stool. Or the other thing is they might have, a, they might pass a small amount of stool every day and they you could be surprised to see how much stool they can accumulate even though they have a bowel movement every day. Uh, <clears throat> so consistency is whether hard or loose. And uh, one, one caveat is uh, sometimes when the child has a stool accidents, it can be loose stool. I mean, uh, I have a couple of parents bring them, uh, actually referred from pediatricians as diarrhea, okay? So when you do a rectal exam, where you check the bottom, uh, it may be liquid stool there, and if you suspect uh, ax stool, fecal incontinence or stool accident, you get an x-ray, you can see enormous amount of stool. So it's like a spurious diarrhea, so you have to be very careful. And uh, some of them, sometimes the parents themselves give them imodium, which is like a, a constipating, so you're making it worse, or the pediatricians have put them on imodium. So uh, it, that can fool you. So it's not like always hard stool. It, children with the stool accidents, it can present like diarrhea. So that is very, very important to remember that. Um, so diameter of the stool, I may, as I mentioned, if it's a large diameter stool, uh, frequent passing. So what happens is the child holds the stool and uh, so they might have small, small amount every day, but once in a week or once in two weeks, they can have an enormous amount of stool which clogs the toilet, they have to use a plunger uh, to do it. Yesterday, one of the child I said, they said, the mom said the stool was like this. <laughs> so it can be really big stool. Uh, and withholding behavior. So what all, what all they do with the withholding? So that's another thing parents have to remember this. So they, they say the child has been trying to poop for a whole day and nothing is coming out. So you know, it looks like child is trying to stool but actually they are holding it. So what all they will do actually one thing is they will just raise the leg up. So when they raise their leg up like this, they squeeze the glutes so their stool don't come out. Other thing is they can tiptoe or rock or other thing most commonly they can hide. When they have to stool, they, are, they will hide in a corner, hide under a table. They know, okay, so uh, something is going on. The parents know that, okay, the child is trying to poop. Um, <clears throat> or they can cross the legs like this. Some of them, they run around like what we call as a doo-doo dance, you know, they run around the home. Uh, so it, be, it can go on for a whole day. And ultimately, they have passed a large amount of stool. So stool with, so that looks like, to, for the parents, it looks like the child is trying to go. And we have to explain to them, it's the, with, that's type, uh, very typical of holding behaviors. The child is squeezing it so it doesn't come out. Now, this withholding behavior, it can start as early as 18 months to 24 months. So it is, you know, it's not, it's uncommon in uh, babies, you know, infants, no, they don't have that withholding behavior, but 18 months as early as that, they can start holding the stool. Uh, so pain with, the pain, pain with the pooping, as I mentioned, even if they can go every day, but if there is hurts, that is uh, 
uh, constipation, uh, bleeding is an alarm sign, okay? So if there is a bleeding, we have to make sure it is not, it's only due to constipation and not, to, not due to other causes uh, for the bleeding. And stool accidents, sometimes uh, unless you ask this question, they, the child may not be forthcoming with this and the parents may not know um, because they can hide the, hide the underwear or put it in the laundry. Uh, what age was child was toilet trained, um, school, then other general symptoms. So this is what we commonly see when they, so any, any kid less than four years old or not toilet trained, the parents can complain, you know, give the history, good history, what's going on, what's happening, but a child who has been toilet trained, they will have usually have this other symptoms like abdominal pain, vomiting, uh, weight loss is an alarm symptom. It doesn't occur with the general constipation. Uh, urinary symptoms, you know, so I'll go through that, what are the urinary symptoms they can have. So, unfortunately, constipation can cause uh, recurrent UTI, especially in girls. It can cause urinary accidents, so both are related actually. The good dietary history, as I mentioned, most of the time we see them, they're not eating uh, fiber at all. There is no fiber in the diet. And uh, excessive milk drinking, so this can happen actually in uh, certain children, especially children with autistic disorders. They, uh, they are picky eaters, they only eat certain amount of food, and excessive milk drinking is one of the causes. And uh, we see even uh, children more than a year old or two years old, they're drinking cow's milk, a lot of milk, high calcium, it does cause constipation. Uh, when did the child pass meconium? So that is important. Usually meconium is the thick uh, greenish black uh, stool the child passes after birth. Usually it should be passed within 24 hours. And if there is a delay more than 48 hours, then that's an alarm sign. You have to look for other things. Um, okay. So this, uh, you know, when the older children come, they come in with abdominal pain. So the pain can be um, going on for a couple of months. And sometimes it can be really severe, especially before having a bowel movement. And the usually the pain is in the, around the belly button area. Sometimes it can be all over the belly. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, sometimes they can be present with vomiting. We see a lot of kids when they are uh, stool impacted, they can present with vomiting, especially when they strain. So they go and sit in the bathroom, they strain, and then they throw up. And uh, I talked about the gastrocolic reflux. So that is a natural, what, what, is, what is it? So food enters the stomach, it tells signal to empty the colon. So that is very important. If there is a stool in the colon, you don't have hunger. You know, the appetite is poor, they don't eat because it's all full, uh, nothing comes out. The child feels better after they have a bowel movement, their appetite improves, they, you know, they eat better. Also irritability is in younger children, you know, infants who cannot express well, and they might have urinary symptoms. So uh, once in a few days, you know, sometimes once a week, once in two weeks, they pass a large amount of stool, and it clogs the toilet, and they feel much better after they poop. Um, so I, 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 we talked about that, what they do for, uh, how do they hold the stool. So you, you can see here, you know, there is a proximity between the colon and the bladder. And when the stool accumulates, it can get so enormous and it can press on the bladder. <coughs> so when it presses on the bladder, it can cause, uh, you know, urgency and frequency. They can have urinary accidents during the daytime. And uh, sometimes what happens is when they press on the bladder, uh, you see there is from the bladder, there is a, from the kidney urine comes through this, what is called a ureter. So when they press on the bladder, it can be so enormous, they'll have a backflow of urine, actually. So it's a, it called vesicoureteric reflux, it's a backflow of urine it can damage the kidney actually. So it is, it can happen, but it is not very common. Um, so we do get a lot of referrals from the urologist who have diagnosed them with uh, constipation because they presented with the urinary infection or urinary accident. So the urologist took an X-ray and say, okay, you're constipation. So that's one of the ways of uh, presentation of constipation in children with the urinary accidents and UTI. 
Okay, so what are the alarm signs and symptoms? You know, this is what we have to make sure the child has, doesn't have these problems. <coughs> so start, starting early in month, early in life, less than a month, we talked about that passage of meconium more than 48 hours. Family history of Hirschsprung's disease. Uh, have anybody heard about Hirschsprung's disease? I'm not from the healthcare, okay. Uh, it's a, it's, it, it does happen, it's not a common disease, but it is a, not a good disease to have. Uh, ribbon-like stools, you know, passing small ribbon-like stools, uh, especially in infancy. Uh, blood in the stools, uh, not growing well, not gaining or growing, you know, functional constipation, no, or, no underlying cause, so usually they should be, they should be eating okay. Uh, it should not affect their growth. <clears throat> And the bilious means any vomiting which is green in color, that means there is some obstruction to the intestinal tract, so that is abnormal. Um, we don't, I mean, uh, very unusual to see an th enlarged thyroid. It's very, I mean, this is a severe abdominal distension. Actually, we do see that, but not in infants. If an infant comes with a large belly, then it's a, it's a, it's a, you have to, it has to trigger something is going on in this infant. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll show a picture of what is this perifistula. Abnormal position of anus, I'll show you all that picture. And, uh, okay, so, yeah, I'll, I'll show you a picture of this, what is the dimple, what is the stuffed of air, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, this neurological problems. Okay, so what happens in, uh, so this is important to know this, so some of the kids, as I mentioned, the parents bring them, not as constipation, but a stool accident. So my child is having uh, uh, accidents multiple times a day. So this is a very distressing problem for the parent as well as the child, because the, you know, the school, they have problem at school, the parents get called. They have to go, parents have to go and bring the child or go extra close, wash, you know, give extra close to them. So it is very distress, distressing. So we have to give letters, to send letters to the school that say don't send the child to the child home because it's a, he's under treatment, it's a common problem. And it is a very distressing problem. It takes a long time to treat. Very important to know, it takes a long, long, long time to treat this. So basically what happens here, so, the, you know, this is the normal colon, and as I mentioned, there is no bone, nothing there. So, this is the stool there. So, when there is a stool, it distances the colon, the, especially the rectum. That's how we feel that we have to go. So, <clears throat> what happens is when the child holds the stool, the colon can get enormous, what we call as a megacolon. So, I'll show some pictures of the megacolon, you'll be surprised to see. So, that's called the megacolon. And then you can see the muscle is nice and thick here. It gets stretched out. And there's a filled with a lot of stool with gaps in it. So when they have gap in that, as I mentioned, the stool coming from the small bowel is liquid. So it has no place to go. It can leak around this and appear as diarrhea. So that's how they can present as accidents. Now the other thing is when it is stretched out, these, I showed you the sphincter at the bottom. It gets stretched out and uh, they decreases the sensation, actually. So the child, unfortunately, don't feel it. Okay, so sometimes we see the parents punishing them. It's, it will make the problem worse if you punish them because they don't feel it. They don't know it is happening and uh, they're not aware of it. And uh, <clears throat> because they don't, they're not aware of it, the other kids in the bus or in the school can smell that, unfortunately, and then they start picking at them and bullying them. That's a very, very, that's a big problem, actually huge. Um, <clears throat> so what we, so we aim to, we aim to make this bowel come back to this size. So the parents ask, uh, you know, why treat for so, mu so many months or years? Actually, it can take months to years. This is the main reason, the colon has to come back to the normal size. So if you stop somewhere here, the problem will recur again. So if the treatment is la la prolonged treatment, okay? What is the normal size of your colon? 
Oh, the diameter? Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, by rectal exam, I can say it is like maybe, you know, the, nobody, uh, most of the time we do the co 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 colonoscopy, mm -hmm. it can expand like so big. Um, if you have to know the normal size of the colon, it's very difficult because when, you, when the, in the autopsy, everything relaxes. So I will say it's about, uh, I mean, there is no norm, I mean, if it is in a relaxed state, everything is collapsed. If it is nothing is there, it is collapsed. And if there is a stool size, probably maybe an inch or, no, you know, maybe an inch and an inch and a half. But it can, as I said, it can get expanded. So normally when you, when you, you know, because I do colonoscopy, when I put the scope in, everything is collapsed. Okay, so when you, only when you put air, it distance. Same way where it is collapsed state, when the stool comes in, it distance. Um, so stool accidents, uh, it can be a small smear to a large amount. And uh, so, you know, so we can make use of this, how the accidents happen. So, I mean, what type of accident it is. So sometimes if you see like a skid mark in the underwear, that means the child is holding the stool, it comes and goes back in. And uh, sometimes you see a smear of stool that may be leaking around. Uh, or sometimes you'll be surprised to see a large amount of stool, like a solid form stool. That means there is a huge amount of stool, and it, you know the sphincter. They cannot, child cannot hold it because it's all stretched out and it is so weak. It, it, the child cannot keep on holding it. Sometimes it relaxes, and then you have some stool coming out. It can be a large amount of form stool. That's where it is very distressing. And this is why you know sometimes it can be pasty or clay-like and then they think it is diarrhea. So the child is not aware of an episode, so it, that's why I said you should not punish the child. And uh, they do, I have, come, I have a couple of teenagers and the parents brought them uh, because they say they saw dirty clothes in the laundry. So that's how they thought, okay, there's something is going on. They brought the, you know, it's, this happens in adolescence more commonly, and you'll be surprised to see, you know, even in adolescence, there's stool accidents, it uh, can happen. Um, okay, so that is school difficulty, we talked about that. Um, so a little bit about ADHD actually, so um, unfortunately, um, we do see constipation more commonly in ADHD kids and also uh, stool accidents is more common in ADHD children. So they are on multiple medications which can cause constipation. Now the stool accidents, you know, we have done a couple of studies also where they is much more common and prevalent in ADHD kids compared to the uh, normal children. The reason is probably they are not paying attention. That's what the most common thing is, you know, they are playing or watching TV. They don't want to take the time to go to the toilet. That's what the most common uh, reason we see. And, uh, you know, treating ADHD do help. So I saw one child where, you know, the child looked like, I mean, was having accidents, child had symptoms of ADHD. I said, I said the mother to go and check for that. And uh, they got checked, uh, started on medication, got better. So the moms came and thanked me, said, okay, it's a miracle, you did a great job. I said, no, that's the treatment of the ADHD, which has helped the child more than what I did. So treating ADHD, and it's not all instances, still they have some problem, but it does help treating the ADHD because they start paying attention to it. Okay, so any other questions so far? Uh, this is uh, very distressing actually. We, so we do see um, <coughs> children with autism with, uh, with um, constipation more common and um, the multiple ER visits and we might have to admit them to do the clean out because it's very hard to do the clean out at home and uh, they might need some enemas to do the clean out which, cannot, which is very difficult for the parents to do and they might have to get, get a clean out through the tube so you know multiple times we have to admit them and it is very very difficult to toilet train them and uh, stool accidents is more common and we have seen kids, uh, teenage years, 14, 15 years, still in their pull-up. So that is a, a very difficult to toilet train them, unfortunately. Now, when you have a colonoscopy, they give you that drink to drink? 
Yes. And that cleans you out. Mm -hmm. That will work in, in those people? Yes. Yes. It does work. So oh, we to use that instead of having to Because they won't drink it. Oh they won't drink it? No. Oh. <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, that's <laughs> So yeah, unfortunately, we have to sedate them to do enemas. We have to sedate them to put an NG tube to clean out. So it is a huge problem. So, um, so I have a couple of kids where I try to, I mean, so they have a, once they go to the hospital, it's a very traumatic experience to them. So I mean, so I try to avoid getting admitted in the hospital. So I try to do the clean outs, small, small amounts you know, every week to keep them clean, so to prevent these impactions and going to the hospital. So it is a, it is a difficult problem. They, they, just, they have only particular type of things they will drink, particular particular type of medication they will take. So it's, uh, it's a huge issue in these uh, kids with autism. Okay, so physical exam is uh, important, okay? So I don't know anybody in the uh, audience say what this it is. So when I was in New York, I saw one kid, one child like this, you know, we don't see it in US. So um, this child was very unfortunate. This child was referred from Caribbeans um, <coughs> uh, with the ostomy, okay? I came in with the ostomy, child was like two years old or something like that with the ostomy uh, for taking care of the problem with constipation. Okay, so when I looked at the child, it is typical, we don't see it in the US anyway. So it is very typical of what is called cretin. So due to low thyroid, hypothyroidism, the thyroid is not working well. So when the thyroid don't work well, uh, they, you know, their facial features are very coarse, they are very short, and they have a large tongue. So I've just put a picture, so it's not very common here, but thyroid problem do happen, but we don't see it to that extreme. The reason is they do new, uh, newborn a screening here, so that's how they diagnose, you know, the congenital hypothyroidism. So <clears throat> we, uh, we look at the growth, how the child is growing well or not growing well. If the child is not growing well, as I mentioned, it's an alarm sign. Uh, general physical examination, always good. Abdominal exam to check for the stool, amount of stool, how big the stool is. Uh, <clears throat> and this is the most important thing, to look at the bottom and the spine. So rectal uh, anal examination and the spine examination is very, very important, especially the first time to make sure there is no underlying cause for the problem. Um, so rectal exam and we always routinely check for the blood in the stool. So <clears throat> the blood in the stool is so, um, why, it, why we have to do it? Sometimes the parents uh, are worried about uh, uh, colon cancer, you know, because it runs in the family. So their parents or grandparents have the colon cancer, so they're worried about this when they come in. That's one of the main worries when they come with this problem, whether my child has colon cancer. Uh, they asked me to do a colonoscopy for a child with constipation. I refused to do that. I said, this is not an indication for colonoscopy, uh, but we will check to make sure there is uh, no colon cancer or anything. So, you know, one, we, I've never seen a colon cancer, luckily, in a child. Um, most of the times we do see polyps, but polyps usually there is a hereditary, meaning it runs in the family. They can have blood, blood in the stool. Um, very, un, very, very rarely the polyp can obstruct and cause constipation. But so you, sometimes we see huge polyps. We had some kids uh, where there are huge polyps which can obstruct. So other than that, it's very, very unusual to have a colon cancer. But I have seen colon cancer, I mean, sorry, I'll take it back. I have seen colon cancer only one time in a child who has what is called neurofibromatosis. I don't know anybody heard about neurofibromatosis in there, um, which is like a skin patch lesions. So they are prone for colon cancer, but we always look for them. So <clears throat> that's why you check for, uh, check for any blood in the stool. So what, so we talked about this, what causes uh, constipation in infants, uh, cow's milk intolerance is the most common cause, but you have to make sure there is no underlying problems. Uh, in um, toddlers and you know, adolescents, functional constipation is the most common cause, but uh, I always look for these two problems, celiac disease or gluten intolerance, and uh, thyroid problems, uh, so those things we have to make sure a uh, <clears throat> couple of kids, and so the celiac disease, usually they present with uh, 
diarrhea and uh, you know poor growth but recently we are seeing it with constipation also in children who are overweight kids it's very unusual couple of times uh, diagnosed uh, uh, celiac disease in constipated children just by doing blood examination um, so I think we went through all that uh, cystic fibrosis sometimes I talked about the teratoma and uh, you know this is very unusual we don't see that much so what do you do so we get we, we talked about that get a good exam history physical exam uh, do a re digital rectal exam get an abdominal so what are the tests you can do and what are the indications for the test so you know, functional constipation. Basically, you just do a physical. I mean, get a good history, physical exam, uh, check the bottom. You know, make sure there is no spinal abnormalities, and uh, check for thyroid and the celiac disease. Okay, so the, those are the common things we do. But sometimes we have to take an X-ray. When do you take an X-ray? Sometimes you have to do what is called as a barium minima. When to do it? Um, manometry. We do we do manometry. Here. It's a specialized testing. So, so there are certain indications, indications to do this manometry. Uh, when do you do the biopsy and uh, this colonic transit time, you ask this question, how long it takes for it to move through the colon? So, you know, sometimes we do the studies to check for if it is a slow moving colon or a normal colon or the child is holding it and uh, the MRI of the spine. So those are all specialized studies, you know, sometimes we have ended up doing this this MRI of the spine, I have a you know, couple of times when they come in with accidents, we are diagnosed as syrinx after getting the MRI of the spine. Okay, so, so I told you about the distension. So this is, so you can see this enormous distension and it can be much more than that. It's usually it is generalized and you have to make sure uh, you know, there is no other tumor or anything like that uh, if this comes with this. Sometimes the parents will be able to Especially in a small ch child, they are able to tell us, okay, when the child is, uh, the belly looks big, it is hard, it is very hard, rock hard, it is tough, I can't press it, in small children. But older kids, they can hide it well. Now, in, in small children, is there always a risk for, if they have abdominal distension after they eat, is there always a risk for gastroparesis? Gastroparesis, you know, gastroparesis is, what it is, is it's a term used where the stomach doesn't empty the food well. So that is called gastroparesis and um, you know I mean we can say it is a delayed gastric emptying is will be a better term to use in that they say. Um, yes as I mentioned you know this I talked about the gastrocolic reflux so if this thing is full the it doesn't empty good so it, 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 it can happen actually and then they actually vomit so we talked about that vomiting also. So gastroparesis is an extreme term and uh, you know, usually we see them in diabetes. So it's uh, sometimes after the viral infections. So delayed gastric emptying can happen. So you have patients though that are pediatrics that have gastroparesis? No, gastroparesis, uh, thank God we don't have that. Yeah. Very, 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 very unusual. Because you know, when they have diabetes, it takes a couple of decades for them to develop gastroparesis. Um, most of the time we have delayed gastric emptying. As I mentioned, I have seen one or two kids with uh, uh, after a viral infection with so-called gastroparesis, but their good prognosis, they recover very well, unlike in adults where they don't, you know, they, they don't recover. So, so okay, so we, so we check for this, what is called as a sacral dimple, you know, so you see this dimple there, very, sometimes you see a tiny dimple, but a large dimple like this. Um, so sometimes the parents told me that, okay, Oh, I've seen this uh, since uh, birth, but I don't know what it is. You know? <laughs> so you have to look for this important to, to look for spinal abnormalities. And uh, this is, uh, you know, you can see this hair at the bottom here. The, that, is, that is, can be associated with, again, spinal cord abnormalities. Um, so this is a little bit about the anatomy here. So we talked about it. So this anus, so this is a female child. So now this is uh, this is if you take approximately this is where the tailbone comes, and this is the end of the genital. So the the anus should be somewhere around here, in girls and boys will be somewhere here. So <clears throat> this is displaced anteriorly. So this is important to look for every child who comes with constipation, 
So that is called anteriorly dis the position is not normal. So when the position is not normal, I showed you the picture, right? The angle before. So the angle becomes much more acute. So stool doesn't come out good. So that's what important to know. So they, they will have constipation forever. So this is a picture of the fissure where they, when, they when they have a hard stool, uh, it cuts the lining called the mucosa and then they have a triangle shaped cut. This is the most common reason for bleeding in children with constipation. And when they have fissure, it's very, 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 very painful. So, when it, so it makes the problem much worse. So they try to hold it more and then uh, <coughs> the constipation gets worse and then they have a hard stool again, the fissure opens up, they bleed again. So this is the most common cause for the bleeding we see due to the fissure. And so when the fissure heals, they can form what is called as a skin tag. And uh, this, if you see this, you have to exclude a Crohn's disease. Sometimes we see this in Crohn's disease, this big skin tags. Um, I, you know, this is again, if you see, you look at the spine, make sure that it's normal. This can be associated with the spinal cord abnormalities. Um, so this is uh, one of the, the tumors I was talking about. So this is the tumor in the, uh, in the, in the, at the end. Sacro, it's called a sacrococcygeal teratoma. This is a tumor. It can press on the colon and the bladder and they cause secondary constipation, okay? Uh, rectal prolapse can be associated with constipation. So we, we do see this pretty common actually. So the, even last week I saw a kid with the, uh, what is called as a rectal prolapse. What it is is the rectum comes out when they, when they try to poop and then it goes back in either spontaneously or the child or the parent has to push back in. That can happen with the long standing constipation and straining. Um, so this is, uh, there is no, this, usually this will be discovered, you know, in the newborn, in the nursery, okay? Where the, this is usually, they, they do check for all this, so there is no opening there, and there is, the opening is abnormally placed, so it, they told you, they'll tell you about the perianal fistula, so you can see this uh, black spot there, that's a stool sitting there. So this will all be diagnosed in the nursery, usually it won't be missed. But the anteriorly placed anesthesis, it can be missed. Uh, um, so it's kind of time, um, I might have to stop there unfortunately, yeah. Uh, do you have any questions? I mean, I'm not able to complete it, but uh, maybe I should do a second talk on the treatment and all that. Uh, I have a clinic, sorry, to go. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, intersusception. Oh, inter intersusception is a, a serious problem. Usually, intersusception, you know, occurs in uh, infants, like less than two years of age. And uh, the intersusception, it's a painful condition. So they come in with, uh, they have abdominal pain. So a child will be crying. Intermittently will be crying. And uh, the belly distension can happen. But also they have bloody stools. The stools are described like a jelly-like stool, currently jelly-like stool. And if it is not treated within 24 to 48 hours, I mean 24 hours, the child will go in for shock. It's a very serious problem. Yeah. Huh. The Miralax, okay. Like, do they stay on it forever? I mean, when do you decide it's time to try them off? Good question. Okay, so a couple of things. One is the you know the make you have to make sure the stool is not coming out enormously big. It should come out small. Second thing is you have to make sure this child has a spontaneous urge to go. So sometimes you know the parents make them sit in the toilet every time. I mean, so the child has to go spontaneously without any, uh, any urge, without any urge from the parents and poop regularly at least once or twice a day, good amount of stool. Then only we have to gradually withdraw the medication. We not suddenly stop it. Now the problem is the studies, you know, it's, uh, it's shows that the recurrence rate is 50% even after stopping 
even if they, they get better. So do you decrease the dose? Yes, or uh, I mean, interval? interval, decrease the interval, because sometimes they, depending on the age of the child, you know, if it is child, suppose the child is on two doses a day, we can decrease it to one dose and see how the child does, and then you can decrease the frequency gradually. To make, but you have to make sure the colon is smaller in size, you know. It is, it, that's why the reason is it takes a long time to come back. And uh, <clears throat> my experiences in child with ADHD kids, it's very, very difficult.